is Shannon Royce. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives here at the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's my privilege today to be here with two men who frankly do not need introduction, Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church and Dr. Francis Collins, uh, the director of the National Institutes of Health. We had the privilege to have a, a conversation a few weeks ago that was an off the record conversation with a small group of key faith leaders. And after that, Rick offered to do a, an on the record conversation with Dr. Collins so that we could share it widely around the nation and around the world. So Rick, we're so grateful for you and thank you for your willingness to, to share this time with us and with Dr. Collins. And I'll turn the program over to you now. I'd like to thank all of you first for tuning in and watching this because it's an item of absolute importance to our nation. And it's an area that I believe uh, the church needs to be taking the lead. Historically, uh, in pandemics in the past, uh, Christians have run to the pain, not from the pain, in order to care for the sick and, and help them and show hospitality. And it's really an honor today uh, to be with my dear friend, Dr. Francis Collins, and be able to ask him uh, uh, some questions about this pandemic, particularly about uh, COVID-19 and the questions that you're always uh, asking and wondering about in your mind. Let me say a personal word about uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, we have been friends, he and I have been friends for many, many years. I think we first met years ago when we were both speaking at the Davos World Economic Forum. And uh, we were two of the few Christians that were actually there at the time. And uh, we just hit it off and spent some time uh, together while we were there. I, I want to say I personally know uh, Francis Collins to be a man of integ integrity. Uh, he is a man that you can trust. Um, he is a brilliant intellect. He is a widely respected researcher. Uh, you probably don't know this, but you've heard of what he worked on, he led the Human Genome Project. And that project, of course, discovered the genes associated with many, uh, uh, a number of diseases. And we've made a lot of progress on these diseases because of the work uh, that Francis and his team uh, led on that. I want to assure you, he is a nonpartisan scientist. And on top of that, he's a Christian brother in Christ. And that's why I asked for the privilege of interviewing him so we could get this message out, because I really believe that uh, when a nation, a state, a province, a city, a community suffers, that uh, we are called. Uh, we, we believe not just in the good news, but we believe in the common good. And God has called us uh, to help people in pain no matter what. Now, I want to start, Francis, with uh, an update on COVID-19, and I'm going to pitch it to you uh, in just a second. As you know, yesterday, the day before we taped this, America set several one-day records uh, in the entire year. We've never gone this high in these numbers. We had 144,000 new cases uh, of COVID-19 in one day. 144,000 in one day. Uh, that's uh, ridiculously high. We have 65,000 people in the hospital yesterday, just yesterday, 65,000. Over 1,400 people died yesterday. Now, let me put that in perspective. In 2020, uh, we've been averaging close to 1,000 people a day. You know, nearly a quarter of a million people have died uh, from COVID-19. Uh, let me compare that. When 9-11 happened, 3,000 people died on one day. In 2020, we've been having a 9-11 every three days. Every three days. This year, we've been having 9-11. This is serious. And we're obviously, uh, Francis, I'm going to ask you about this, uh, in uh, a second wave of COVID-19 pandemic. And it's obviously going to be worse than the first wave. And it's personal to me because here in my county, in Southern California, in Orange County, the virus has already killed three times as many people in my county as the seasonal flu does on an annual basis. Three times what just regular flu does. 
uh, we usually average about 540 deaths a year from seasonal flu in, in my county, which has uh, several million people in it. Uh, but it's all, COVID's already killed 1,512. And uh, I've had staff who died. Uh, uh, Dan Morgan, who was formerly on my staff in missions, uh, was on a ventilator for two weeks and lost his life uh, this last week. And so now I just talked to the health department here that uh, yesterday that uh, in Orange County, we have about 1,300 people a year die from strokes and 1,400 a year die from Alzheimer's, but we've already had 1,500 this year die from COVID. So this is, this is not make-believe. This is not a minor issue. Talk to me, uh, uh, Francis, Dr. Collins, uh, uh, about uh, an update on what you see uh, as the weather gets colder and things like that. Well, Rick, uh, please call me Francis, by the way, and uh, let me say what a privilege it is to be able to have this conversation with you about such a significant issue that faces our country, faces the whole world. Yeah. It's been a privilege to count you and Kay as my friends over these years. And if there's ever a time for friends to get together, not directly two feet <laughs> apart, but get together spiritually and with a determined sense of how we can do everything possible uh, to turn back this terrible challenge. This is that moment. So if I can help in some way, I am really glad to talk to you and hope that these words uh, can be heard by many. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me just say, uh, as a Christian uh, who has seen the devastation uh, of this virus across our country, across our world, I think it's fair to just take a moment here and say, we are all grieving. Uh, there is so much hurt, so much sorrow family members uh, who have been lost, yeah. others who are struggling uh, for life in hospitals all over this country, especially right now in the upper Midwest, but no part of the country is really being spared at this present time. And so, yeah, it's a moment of a lament uh, for us as a Christian community. But as you said, it's also the moment for Christians to remember what we do when there are needs and there's a crisis and people need help is we don't run away, we run toward that need. And there are ways we can do that now, even while adhering to really important public health measures about not making things worse uh, by unintentionally spreading the disease further, especially to vulnerable people. You already put forward these frightening numbers uh, of what has just happened uh, the day before we're taping this. And I'm sorry to say, if you look at the shape of those curves, it's not like we were going up and now we've kind of hit the top of the peak and maybe we're gonna start down again. We're still on the steep upward slope for the number of cases per day. We could easily hit 200,000 cases in a day in the next couple of weeks at the pace it's going. Mm -hmm. And hospitalizations, which are even more alarming because that means people are really sick, Mm -hmm. have hit the highest number they've had for our country since this all started. This is worse than the New York, New Jersey experiences of March, April, and May. And this is worse uh, than the Miami and Houston and Southeast uh, U.S. experiences in July. And again, those statistics are climbing upward. Mm -hmm. And of course, most of concern, uh, the deaths which had managed to go down for a while, not far enough, but maybe 700 a day now are double that. And again, mm -hmm. the shape of that curve is steeply mm -hmm. upward. So we are facing what is clearly going to be a very difficult couple of months as cold weather has come along, as people are now thinking about getting together for Thanksgiving and Christmas, mm -hmm. which we all want to do, but which could be actually in this circumstance, a source of serious risk. Mm -hmm. And we're going to all have to gather together, put aside a lot of the noise that's out there, <laughs> a lot of noise, and figure out what can we do as Christians to help sustain each other, especially those most vulnerable who have the greatest risk, if they acquired this virus, of not being able to survive. It breaks my heart that up until now, we haven't been particularly good at mm -hmm. gathering together mm -hmm. with a shared purpose uh, driven by our our convictions that God is calling us uh, to do the right thing, to help those who are most vulnerable. But maybe it's not too late with this particular challenge in front of us. Let's see what we can do as a body mm -hmm. of Christ to try to do what I think Christ would call us to do, to be healers, uh, to be those who are reaching out to try to preserve life. Do you think part of the problem, you know, as I understand a novel virus, 
uh, because it's a novel virus, it, uh, uh, you could, uh, first place, there's no known human immunity to it. And so we, we've, that's why we don't have a, a vaccine for it. Uh, but uh, you can have it and not be symptomatic, but you could spread it. That's scary. Scary. Rick, you're just right. That is what is so diabolical about this virus. Mm -hmm. And it's different than the flu and different than SARS and MERS, those uh, uh, mm -hmm. previ previous viruses that were from this same family. Yeah. What is so difficult uh, in terms of management of this virus is about 40% of the people who get infected never know that they have it, but they're really good at spreading. <laughs> and we've never really seen anything quite like that before. And no, that no, we haven't. And I think that's honestly why, Francis, there are all of these different conspiracy theories that come out, because it's not like if you've got it, uh, you actually ha have the symptoms. You can have, have it and actually be spreading it to other people all around you who would get sick uh, and, and maybe even die from it. And so it's, we're fighting an enemy we can't see a lot of the time. And every Christian needs to think about what that means for them. That means when I go out uh, this evening, I'm going out to an event at the National Cathedral with Tony Fauci. It'll be all very physically distanced. I have to think about when I walk out the front door, could I be one of those people who is now infected without symptoms because I'm feeling okay? And I could be the vector that would spread this to unwitting yeah. people around me. Yeah. I could be. And that's yeah. why I'm going to wear that mask as right. soon as I go out the door. Not that it's going to protect me so much. It'll help a little bit, but it'll protect other people from me if I happen to be the one who's a super spreader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got so mixed up about masks, uh, Rick, and it became uh, sort of a sign of something other than public health, something that took on more of a political significance. That was really unfortunate for me as a non-political person, a physician, yeah. scientist. It just breaks my heart that something as simple as this, which you could sort of think of in the same vein as a seatbelt, just puts mm -hmm. this on in order to protect yourself and other people. It's so simple. And yet it became a badge of some sort, a, a yeah. declaration of some position that really never should have been attached to it. So I hope that people listen to this. If you have been in a circumstance where somebody's trying to tell you masks don't do any good, yeah. Well, the data says the masks are the best thing we could do right now. It's a recent prediction. If we all put on masks faithfully, wore them every day, when as soon as we left the house, uh, we could save 130,000 lives. Okay, okay, say that again. If we all wore a mask, we could save up to 130,000 lives, you said. That's amazing. That's, that's the estimate. Just a simple, you know, to me, Francis, uh, wearing a mask is is not a uh, political statement. Wearing a mask is the great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. yes. Okay. If you want to, you know, one day Jesus is walking down the street and a guy walks up to him and says, uh, uh, Lord, what's the most important command in the Bible? And Jesus said, oh, that's easy. I can summarize the whole Bible in two sentences. All the law and the prophets can be summed up in two statements. I'm going to give you cliff notes on the Bible. Here it is. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and love your neighbors yourself. That's it, that's it. It's all about love. And right now, the most practical way I can show love for my neighbor is wear a mask. Uh, I had a guy the other day uh, say, well, I don't like to wear a mask because it's confining. I said, no, a coffin is confining, okay? <laughs> okay, being in ICU is confining. Wearing a mask is not confining. You can go anywhere you wanna go, just wear a mask. and and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's, yeah. let's talk about um, what families could do, and, and let's talk about what faith communities could do. Churches, uh, you know, synagogues, uh, temples. How, how could we, uh, as, in, as families, and uh, then as, as faith communities, uh, make a difference? And uh, as we talk about families, we're getting ready to come into the most family period of the year with all these holidays. Talk about that. Well, that is a really serious issue, Rick. Um, I'm very concerned that if we practice our usual wonderful Thanksgiving and Christmas traditions without concern about COVID, we're going to see an even further spiking of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths because 
We now know uh, one of the reasons why this increase is happening so dramatically. It's not so much that people went to the movie theater because they're not really doing that much anymore. It's yeah. not that they went to a big football game because they're not doing that either. It's family gatherings or parties. Halloween probably did not help. Um, young people, of course, are particularly likely to sort of throw caution to the winds and then they become the vectors who infect their grandparents and potentially mm -hmm. cause terrible outcomes. So it's got to be about all of us. But Thanksgiving, I do not believe responsibly by Christians who are practicing love for mm -hmm. the most vulnerable can mm -hmm. be carried out in the way that it normally would be. Mm -hmm. I will say uh, for my own self, for the last 27 years, my wife and I have had Thanksgiving in Michigan uh, with my daughter and son-in-law and grandkids. It is a tradition that I deeply love. They invite, mm -hmm. there's usually 30, 35 people there. There's at least two or three turkeys. It's a wonderful gathering that only happens that once a year. And this year, we've decided it's just too much of a risk. And so mm -hmm. my wife and I will be having Thanksgiving by ourselves with a Zoom yeah. <laughs> to check in with people. And yeah, that's a lump in my throat. But it is also the right thing to do because my son-in-law is at risk. Uh, other people who would be at that gathering are even more at risk because mm -hmm. of chronic illnesses or age. And, you know, it's not worth the joy of having a Thanksgiving if it results then in the terrible tragedy right. of a terrible illness or a death. And the right. same, I'm sorry to say, may be true of Christmas. We're going to have to come up with new ways to approach yeah. this. If you looked at my blog, and I'm sure you did, uh, <laughs> today, <laughs> On the NIH director's blog, I put out a bunch of ideas about ways uh, to approach Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah, 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 you did. People safe, but would not be so completely gloomy, which. <laughs> <would be great. laughs> well, explain to people why, you know, e eating is actually uh, uh, more risky than even having a conversation because you're, you're not wearing a mask, but also we, we tend to project those. Uh, those molecules when we're eating. Exactly. And all it takes is one person around a table of 24 who's that a person who's infected but doesn't know it. And then that whole room is at risk. And we've seen examples of uh, weddings recently yeah. uh, where terrible outcomes happen because people just thought, oh, it won't happen here. Mm -hmm. I know I sound like such a downer, uh, Rick, and I know people want to hear, you know, somehow we'll get through this. It's okay. Just uh, you can take the chance. We can't uh, look and see what's happening across our nation. And it's about masks, and it's also about those other things, the six-foot distances, right? Uh, the washing your hands every chance you get, all of those yeah, things. Well, and don't gather inside. That's particularly risky because that's where the airflow is not helping you. Yeah. You know, uh, our church still has not had public worship services uh, mm -hmm. since March. Uh, we're doing them online. Uh, we're doing other things instead. Uh, we're going to actually do a drive-through Christmas service this year uh, yeah. because uh, uh, we're, we're taking the campus so that people will come in one uh, entrance and go out the other, and they'll drive through. It's kind of the opposite of uh, like a Disneyland light parade where you stand still and people things come past you. We're doing the opposite. Uh, but uh, you know, people don't understand that uh, as a pastor, uh, I'm not pressured by what other churches are doing, not at all. I, I am called by God as a shepherd to protect the flock that God has put under my care. And I am not willing to gamble the health of my members just so I can have a live audience to speak to. I'm sorry, my ego doesn't require that. I don't have to. And, and the myth that, well, if we're a small church, well, then uh, we, you know, we're, we're okay. No, I happen to know, you know, I know a lot of pastors. I've trained over a million pastors in 164 countries in the last 30 years. So I have a lot of connections. And I know a church in Alabama that had 40 members and they uh, actually had 80 members. And they said, uh, we're going to uh, have a service. And those of you who want to come can come. And those of you who don't want to come, don't come. 40 of the 80 members of this small church came. All 40 came down with COVID. So it, it, it's, it's not about size as much as it is proximity. What I've seen, and let's move on to faith communities right now. We've talked about families. Um, I have seen that uh, a lot of churches are, are, do a pretty good job of creating the seating. 
Okay, in other words, they're, they're meeting outside, they're putting uh, two chairs together here and then a big space and a couple chairs over here, maybe four with a family, and, and, and people will abide by the seating. But the moment the service is over, they get up and gather like they're used to gathering, and they're talking two feet apart or one foot apart from each other and pulling their mask down. And so I don't trust human behavior right now uh, to do the right thing, particularly when I haven't seen all my members face to face in you know about eight or nine months uh, that I know we got together, they'd want a hug. Uh, we're a hugging church. And I'm yeah. going, I'm just not going to set up an environment where I don't trust human behavior with all the best intentions. They'll sit where you want them to sit, but before the service and after the service, they're mixing up. And uh, so let's talk about what uh, churches specifically can do. And I want to set this up with a little bit of history. Uh, the fastest growth of Christianity was actually in the first 300 years of the church, from zero to 300 uh, AD. That was the fastest period of growth. One of the factors that caused that rapid growth of Christianity, where it went from, you know, 12 disciples to becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, is in the first and the third century, they had two plagues. Uh, one of them was called uh, uh, the Justinian plague. I don't remember what the other one was called, but one in the first century and one in the third. And of course, in those days, uh, people didn't know anything about germs or viruses uh, or disease or bacteria. Uh, and many people thought that, well, it's happening in the city and uh, hundreds of thousands, even millions actually died in those plagues. And so uh, people started fleeing the cities. Christians actually moved into the cities to care for the sick and dying. And in showing hospitality, they invented a new way of showing hospitality called the hospital. And most people don't realize the church formed the very first hospital during those two plagues, where they would bring the sick together and begin to care for them like that in a group. And so Christians have been doing health care for 2,000 years. How can the faith community, how can churches and other groups uh, make a difference right now in, 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 this, in this pandemic? What could we do? Well, it is a challenge because what the church usually has done is to run towards the problem and throw their arms around the people who are suffering. And of course, yeah. this pandemic, because of its infectious problem, uh, doesn't sit well uh, with that kind of personal closeness. Right. But it doesn't mean uh, that the love and the outreach uh, can't find other paths mm -hmm. forward. I know many churches are working hard to try to help with the food shortages that yeah. are happening, especially yeah. uh, in cities, but not just in cities, because so many people have been hit really hard economically, lost their jobs. The way in which they were getting by is getting thinner and thinner and hard to manage. So anything churches can do to help with food pantries, food drives, is well worth it. The needs are great out there. Can uh, I offer that, pastors a couple suggestions? Sorry? Can I offer pastors a couple suggestions right now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I, I have thought a lot about this because we, we are a church where one of our values is every member is a minister. And so everybody's volunteered. We've done lots of, we, this is our 30, I believe our 33rd national or international disaster crisis that we've mobilized people for. And I think what churches today are asking the wrong question. They're asking the question, how do we get the community back inside the church? And really when we, when the pandemic hit, I said, guys, we're gonna do the exact opposite. How do we get out into the community in a safe, socially distant way and help people uh, there. So rather than focus on trying to get people to come to our building, we said, how do we get our members out helping those? And as you mentioned, the very first thing is people need food. With the uh, millions of people, uh, or millions of businesses closed down and tens of millions of people out of work, people who never had been in a food line uh, now needed food. And so we started setting up, we used to have, um, well, we just still have, we have uh, three uh, food banks, three food pantries in Southern California. And typically before COVID hit, we were feeding about 2000 families a month before this pandemic. The first month, March, we fed 45,000 families. We just passed our 500,000 family wow. that, that we fed. 
And what we did is we invented a new thing to say, you don't have to have a building to distribute food. You can do pop-up food distribution. And so we went out and we partnered with all the school districts in our county that we'll come to your school district, we'll come to your school. And in, on, on a single day in your parking lot, here's how we set it up. And we started serving people. We went to parks. We partnered with the County Board of Supervisors. They asked Battleback to do it. There used to be 126 food uh, uh, pantries in Southern California. 126 closed down uh, at the beginning of COVID because all of a sudden there was a hoarding of, of food and, and panic buying and they didn't have anything. So we went out and we started over 480 food pop-ups. No building, just going to an area and starting it. I've had over, I believe it's now past 14,800 members have served over 3 million or 4 million pounds of food to a half a million, 500,000 families since this started. Wow. We have built bridges of goodwill to these people all around. We share the good news with those who want to hear, but we just offer, the, it's not, it's for anybody. We don't care what your background is. We just want to serve you and serve food. And it has built, uh, increased the reputation of Saddleback Church. And so we were doing this and we called that a killer app. We said, well, what else could we do? Because we're, we're not bringing everybody to the church for worship services. What else could we do out there? And we decided that parents were pulling their hair out Kids were bored uh, because the kids are at home and the parents are at home and they're supposed to be doing school online. And, and so we started a series of, of apps uh, or uh, programs that we call First Aid for Families. And it is to help parents and to help kids and to help school teachers uh, get the job done with, with the best that we can. One of the things we found in some of our areas is that families in poorer areas, the kids were embarrassed to go online because they didn't want pe anybody to see what their home looked like. And they didn't want Uncle uh, Jeff, you know, walking behind without a shirt on and his beer belly and the, kid, the baby crying in the corner. So we found out how to make, um, for instance, screens to put up just screen uh, behind the child when he opens his laptop uh, to go online. And so it gives him a little bit of privacy. It's a big hit. So there are ways if you'll reverse the thinking we said to our elderly people in our church, I know you serve and you have served and you love to serve, but really right now we need you to just stay home, okay? And so we, don't, we really don't want you out distributing food. We don't want you out doing one of these things. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a thing called Care Callers. And we're gonna give you a list of people in, in our church family and you sit at home and you call them and say, Pastor Rick asked me to call you to see how are you doing? What do you need? You need supplies? You need groceries? You need us to bring you anything? We can do a door dash, dash drop uh, to your place, no hands on it. And so we gave them a ministry at home. Some of the guys said, well, I don't like to talk on the phone. I said, fine, we'll make care writers. I'll give you a list of names. You can just write an encouraging note to people and you do it from your home. So I would encourage pastors, priests, ministers to think through how to move, focus more on your ministry of your church right now when you're not being able to worship. There's more than one purpose to the church, and that could those, be something that people could do. Those are inspiring and wonderful, wonderful ways that people can do what Christians have always been called to do at a time like this. I'll give you one more, and that is volunteer to take part in a clinical trial it's going to help us figure out uh, how to get through this, both in terms of new treatments that are being tried out, if you happen to have tested positive, mm -hmm. and also vaccines, which we're in the middle of, and there's some exciting news just this week about those, but we still have many more vaccine trials that need to be conducted to be sure we found the very best options here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go to, to a website called coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. Okay. That's okay. a lot of letters there, coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. Uh, you can register your interest in a clinical trial for a vaccine. And if it turns out that there's a recruitment center near you, they might reach out and say, hey, can we talk? Because we're depending now, on everybody to step up to this one as well. That's the only way we find out whether things are safe and effective. Let's don't forget, you just slid over it earlier, uh, talking about the, the importance of the three W's. 
Uh, yeah. And, and let, let's go back to, I want to talk about uh, uh, the vi- I mean, the uh, vaccine in just a minute, because everybody's interested in that. But let's just go back over to something that everybody can do. You talked about wearing a mask, but what else? What's the, what's the basics that everybody can do right now? Well, remember those three W's. That's the way to keep it in your head. Wear your mask. That's the first W. Mm-hmm. Watch your distance. That's to say, don't get closer than six feet to somebody who might be actually infected, or you might. And yeah. wash your hands. Mm-hmm. So wear, watch, and wash. And wear, keep that wash, in the front of your head. wash. That's, that's good. <laughs> the three W's. If okay. we all did that, we could save maybe more than 100,000 lives. It's not that hard. And again, maybe it's a little confining. You have that mask on. You had a good response to that. But so is the seatbelt. But we all got used to it. We did it. We need to get used to this one, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of, spent a lot of time in, in Asia. And when MERS came out and SARS came out and avian flu and a lot of those that started in, in different Asian countries, they started wearing masks, but when that was over, a lot of people just kept wearing them. So there was a culture built there that yeah. we Americans didn't have when this one hit. And no. it, it, wearing a mask is, I think people are getting more and more used to it because it's not gonna go away quickly. And I will recognize the messages were a little confusing at first in the first couple of months because we didn't really appreciate this potential of people who have no symptoms being mm-hmm. potentially really seriously infected that's so back then. There is no question now. Let nobody tell you that we don't really have the data. The data says masks save lives and we all should wear them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I see that. And also, you know, uh, there might have been the feeling that do we have enough masks for everybody right now? That's not a question now. Everybody's in the production of masks. Um, yeah, the American awesome. entrepreneurial spirit went into overdrive and you can get it in any shape, size, or color. Is there is there a better kind of mask and than than uh, other kinds? Or, or they're not all at, masks are equally effective. No, but you want a cloth mask is fine for when you're going out in public. It'd be good mm-hmm. if it had more than one layer. And if more than good, one layer would be better. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it needs to cover your nose mm-hmm. as well as your mouth. Um, mm-hmm. And it doesn't work if it's under your chin <laughs> or on the top <laughs> of your head. The place you're trying to block yeah. is where those droplets uh, yeah. come out when you're talking or just breathing, which is your nose yeah. and your mouth. Now, I've seen uh, during some of the NFL football games this season, some of the coaches are wearing these uh, plastic masks, but they're not wearing a, 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 a mask underneath it. And so it seems like the, it could just come right up into your nose. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that would be very helpful unless you're actually wearing a cloth mask underneath it. Yeah, uh, the cloth mask we know is simple, it's easy, and it's effective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Francis, we're all interested in uh, the vaccine. Uh, we heard first some positive uh, reports this week out of Pfizer and others. Talk, talk to us about uh, uh, safety and uh, the efficiency and the efficacy of, of a potential vaccine. So this has been uh, a compelling passion for all mm-hmm. of the scientific community, me included, uh, mm-hmm. since January when it was clear that this was going to be a potential threat to the world. And so the entire ecosystem of science pulled into gear, uh, the academic institutions, the NIH, which I have the privilege of leading, the industry mm-hmm. representatives, uh, CDC and FDA, everybody said, okay, we've got to do this together in an unprecedented kind of partnership. Yeah. Normally, it takes something between five and 10 years uh, to develop a vaccine and prove that it's safe and effective. Uh, We're on the brink of being able to say we've done that in less than a year because this Mm -hmm. is going right now in the extremely positive way. The news from just a few days ago was the first one of these that has now reached the point in a very large scale trial Mm -hmm. uh, of some 44,000 people, uh, half of whom got the vaccine half of whom got a placebo of what would look in uh, every other way like the vaccine. Mm-hmm. They don't know which one they got and the people administering it don't know either. Mm-hmm. But now they unblinded the data and they showed that the vaccine was in fact 90%, maybe 95% effective in preventing mm-hmm. illness, which is dramatically better than we had rights to hope for. Remember your flu shot, which you should be getting, and I hope you have already. I've already gotten mine. 
All yeah. right, me too. Uh, <laughs> but it only probably on an average year has maybe 50% effective because that's the best we can do. The flu keeps changing. For this new coronavirus uh, mm -hmm. to have a vaccine that looks this good, thank you, Lord. This is like such an incredibly positive moment. That's the first one. The second uh, one, which uses the same technology from a company mm -hmm. called Moderna, just announced that they've also hit the appropriate milestone to unblind the data mm -hmm. and look. And in the next few days, uh, we'll hear what their efficacy is. Now, what about safety? The FDA has been pretty tough about this. Mm -hmm. They said they're not going to approve anything unless you have at least two months of careful mm -hmm. scrutiny of people who got the vaccine to see if there's any safety problems. For the first two vaccines, those two months will be up in the next oh, couple, three weeks. So I think there's a very good chance, Rick, that by the end of November, we'll have one and possibly two vaccines that FDA says mm -hmm. that is good enough for emergency use authorization. We can start immunizing the highest risk people starting in December. Wow. I'm not promising that, but that would be yeah. my best guess of where we are. Yeah. Now, of course, we will not have 330 million doses of vaccine on that first day. Uh, there right. may be something in the neighborhood of 50 million doses. So we will have to prioritize. And the priority has to be for the people at highest risks, which may be healthcare providers and people in nursing homes and uh, older people and people with chronic disease. And the CDC has a group that's working intensively right now to try to figure out how to put those priorities in order. So people are going to need to be patient and people are going to need to recognize this is an incredible logistics challenge that won't mm -hmm. be so easy, but we'll get it done. And for most of the people who are otherwise not at high risk, it's mm -hmm. going to take uh, months going into the spring, maybe even the summer before yeah. Americans can have access. The thing that I really want to mention, though, Rick, and that worries me the most is when you ask Americans right now, if we had the vaccine, would you roll up your sleeve? And about half of them are saying, mm, I don't really think so. I'm not sure yeah. I can trust this. Yeah. This would be the greatest, saddest tragedy you can imagine if we have come up with a solution to get COVID-19 behind us and save all those lives. And people go like, mm, I don't know if I really want to do this because I read this conspiracy thing on social media that said maybe there's a chip in that uh, particular vaccine that came from Bill Gates. I mean, stuff like that, which is out there all over the place, could potentially take what could be a really triumphal moment and turn it into a trend. I hope that doesn't happen when people yeah. start to see the data. Well, I, uh, I, I agree with you on that, that we need to be patient and take time because I, I figured not only just the, the, the rollout of the production, but also the rollout of the distribution. Uh, you know, it, we, we might take a year to get everybody out there. And, and part of that is, as you say, the psychological resistance Mm -hmm. that unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, this pandemic got politicized. And, uh, and as a result, uh, people start taking sides as if this was a political issue. It's not. And let me just say a word to priests and pastors and rabbis and uh, other uh, faith leaders. Uh, this is our job uh, to deal with these conspiracy issues and things like that. I remember... Uh, a week before the election, I heard on a Christian radio station, a Christian talk show guy, and he was saying, you know, this is all just a political plot, and the day after the election, the, the virus will vanish, so you don't really need to wear a mask. And, well, I hope that he's changed his mind now that the week after we had the highest number of, of people who died, who were infected, uh, who got the, got, got the, uh, the virus, and uh, when people say, well, this is all a hoax, tell that to the families of the quarter of a million people who've died, okay? And uh, I saw last night uh, on, on uh, one report that, uh, you know, there's 197 nations in the world. Uh, it used to be 196, but Sudan split, and so there are 197. Uh, 195 are part of the UN. The only two nations not in the UN are uh, Serbia and Taiwan. In that list of, 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 of 197 nations, yesterday, America came in at the 10th worst in, in terms of the number of people, percentage per capita, uh, having this, this thing. 
So it, it can't, it's no hoax. People are dying. People are, are, are uh, uh, getting very, very sick. People are, and, and now we're seeing the long-term effects of this, right? You, you, you've been reading about the, I don't know what they call it, but it's uh, the long-term effect that people who've had it are, are actually can get reinfected. Uh, and and then uh, are having long-term lung or other organ problems. Yeah, that is a source of serious concern that some proportion of people who have COVID, even if they weren't that sick, some of them don't get better like you would think they would from a typical mm -hmm. respiratory virus. And weeks or even months later, uh, they are still fatigued, they're short of breath. Uh, you do cardiac studies and you see there's something not quite right about their heart muscle. So we may be also seeing a long tail of consequences uh, to this, which is all the more reason we don't want people to get infected in the first place. Mm -hmm. The idea we could just sort of let the virus rip and eventually we'd get the herd immunity, that is the wrong answer <laughs> if you care about human lives. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's not a love your neighbors yourself answer. No. Okay, no. every life uh, matters to God, every life is important. Um, so this hesitancy to be vaccinated I really want to say this is uh, one of the responsibilities of faith leaders it is to calm the fears and to uh, tell people, you know, trust the science. That we're, they're not going to put out a vaccine that's going to hurt people. And we, and, and, and whatever it takes, it'll take that amount of time to get it tested and, and done. Um, but we need to, uh, I, I, one of the verses I used this last week in my message uh, is out of Proverbs says, uh, the gullible will believe everything they're told. <laughs> and we don't need gullible people right now, okay? We need just the facts. The Bible says in Proverbs, get the facts at any price. And so, and, and hold on to the facts. Mm -hmm. um, Francis, one of the issues that some people I know are concerned about is uh, the use of fetal cells uh, in vaccine candidates and, and the concerns that that raises for uh, you know, right to life community and things like that. So give us some, some explanation on this right now. Yeah, and I do understand people's concern about this. Uh, basically, there are fetal cell lines uh, mm -hmm. that were derived in the 1970s, um, one in particular called HEK293, uh -huh. derived from an elective pregnancy termination in Scandinavia, uh, where that particular cell line was started uh, from the fetus. And it has been in culture ever since, and it happens to be one that is particularly useful Mm -hmm. uh, for growing uh, other kinds of viruses. Uh -huh. And so it's found its way into lots of labs. And it has, in fact, been used in a few other circumstances uh, with other vaccines, although not that many. And I understand, and the Catholic Church has looked at this very carefully, uh, that for people who are opposed uh, deeply uh, to abortion, and I'm sympathetic sure. with those people, believe me, uh, sure. this feels like you're somehow being complicit uh, if you're utilizing a product that tra traveled through uh, this kind of cell line, even if it was derived 50 or 60 years ago. It's 50 it's years ago. Huh. Yeah, there, mm -hmm. there is no active use of human fetal tissue at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. in vaccine production or in production of the monoclonal antibodies, which is an exciting new kind of treatment that just mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. emergency use authorization a few, years, a few days ago for people who have just gotten infected. Mm -hmm. So I want to reassure people about that. There is no human fetal tissue being utilized. The only use is the cell lines uh, from decades earlier. But I do understand that for some people, that would be something they would like not to have to be asked uh, to sure. use. I'm happy to say of the six vaccines that are currently being developed, uh, two of them, probably four of them, uh, would not trouble people because they have not gone through that particular kind of cell line. Uh, mm -hmm. Two of them, needed by necessity uh, by the manufacturing process to do so. So there should be options here for people who find this to be particularly critical. Mm -hmm. And I'm sympathetic with that, although I must say it is a little harder for me to see why it is unethical if this is a cell line that's been around that long, mm -hmm. uh, not to take advantage of something that might save a life. But that's not my decision mm -hmm. to make for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think the Catholic Church was pretty clear that Catholics are allowed to take advantage of such products if there are no other options. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and they are going to be beneficial for themselves or their families. Uh -huh. uh, there are uh -huh. gonna be other options, but that's the place we are right now. Well, great. Um, I wanna get your feedback uh, on, on another issue, and that is the, the mental health effects of this yeah. pandemic. Uh, you know, I had a son who struggled with mental health issues, with mental illness uh, from childhood, and, and took his life seven years ago. Uh, Matthew was a brilliant kid, a uh, wonderful guy, but just struggled with mental illness his entire life. And I have been telling uh, uh, pastors and priests that even after we find a vaccine uh, for this, there's going to be a tsunami of grief. You mentioned this in your opening remarks, that people right now, it's almost like in stage one when you're in shock. And when we start to see, oh, here's the light at the end of the tunnel, you start realizing all the things you've lost, mm -hmm. uh, all of the graduations that were missed, mm -hmm. the weddings that were missed, the Thanksgivings that are going to be missed, and the Christmases that are going to be missed. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, I wasn't there when the baby was born, and relatives couldn't travel for the wedding. And, and there's been a lot of loss. And so uh, not just, there are people who will never get COVID, but they've been powerfully traumatized by, by this. And, uh, and of course, as, uh, as faith leaders, that's right up our alley. We're supposed to deal with the spiritual and emotional side. I, I started a series in March that I just finished. It was a 30-week series through the book of James that I called Principles for Living Through a Pandemic. Uh, the book of James was written to people who had lost their homes and lost their jobs and had been spread out all over, not because of a pandemic, but because of persecution. And their lives were thrown upside down. And James is writing to encourage them uh, in a crisis. And I said, you know, while uh, people like, like you, Dr. Francis Collins and uh, those at the CDC and other places are, are, uh, are working on the disease, I said, it's my job as your pastor to help you with the dis-ease, okay? The, the dis-ease of the pandemic, the emotional and spiritual uh, fallout from quarantining and isolation and loneliness and too much change and so many things on that. So uh, I would love to hear your, your thoughts about, uh, uh, you know, the effects of this pandemic on the mental health of our nation. In many ways, we've had a nation totally traumatized. We have, and you're right, that the full experience of that probably still lies somewhat ahead mm -hmm. as people are just trying to get through each day and maybe not even fully allowing themselves to experience the grief and the loss. I'm so glad you brought this up, uh, Rick. I, I worry a lot about across this nation, across the world, people who are suffering in silence, trying to get through it and may not feel like anybody's around to listen to them. The church could be mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. waiting until we get mm -hmm. through this, but right now, mm -hmm. a source of that kind of love and comfort, even mm -hmm. if it's gotta be done remotely, and we have learned, I think the mental health system has, that actually doing this sort of thing remotely works pretty well. Mm -hmm. There are mental health counselors who would tell you that their ability to reach out to people using things like Zoom was much better than they thought it would be. And that mm -hmm. people were able to connect that way uh, in a fashion that they didn't think was going to work. So I would really encourage uh, all those counselors and pastors uh, that are listening to this, and you know, Rick, uh, to take every moment here to reach out to those who may have had some history perhaps of struggling a bit uh, with mental health issues because they're the most vulnerable right now. I worry a lot about people struggling with substance use uh, and abuse. Uh, we know that the opioid crisis was already terrible before right. COVID-19 came along. It's been hard to figure out exactly what has gone on there, but it has not been good and probably overdoses and overdose deaths have also been going up this year, despite our inability necessarily to track them. So if there are people in your church who you know have had those issues with drugs or with alcohol, they would particularly be good to reach out to and just be, you know, a listening ear 
who's willing uh, to come alongside, even if it's through a Zoom call, yeah. and, and help them get through this very challenging time. I think that is another big part of this iceberg that's happening. Maybe the tip is what we see, the most terrible cases of mm -hmm. the illness, but there are all these other consequences. And of course, the economic crisis adds to the mental health distress that a lot of people are going through. So yes, church people, this is your chance as well to really rise to the occasion, do what Christians have always done, come forward with love. Well, we know that people are more open to spirituality and to God uh, when they're under tension or in transition, major change in life. You know, when things are going great, everybody forgets God. The, the Bible's full of stories about that uh, in, the, in the history of Israel. Uh, but when things get tough, we go, God, we, we, we need help. And so, um, you know, one of the myths of this, uh, you've heard people say, I've heard it on TV many times, well, we're all in the same boat. Well, no, we're not. We're all in the same storm. We're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some people are going through this storm in a yacht. And, and if they have high-speed internet and can work from home, they're probably doing okay. Uh, others are in a rowboat uh, without a paddle because they're out of work and they don't have any income coming in and they can't work from home. Their jobs are not a work from home job. And, and they're just kind of uh, without a paddle. And then the homeless, they're just holding on to a piece of driftwood. I mean, how do you shelter at home when you don't have a home? And so we're not all in the same boat. We're in the same storm. And when we entered this, I need to say to pastors that in your church, you have three kinds of people. You have people who entered this, um, you, know, you know, you have an emotional and spiritual tank inside you. And if you entered this year with your tank pretty full uh, at the beginning of the year, it's been draining during the year, but you, you're probably doing okay because you entered it with a, with a full tank. Others already had stress going on in their lives and their tank was only half full. And so it's, it's getting down really low uh, as we've getting into, you know, month 10 and month 11 and month 12 uh, of this. And some people, because of stress that was in their life, they came into this pandemic with their tank empty. And, and they're the ones I'm most concerned about that you're talking about. And this is where the opioid crisis and, and looking to, uh, uh, you know, self-medication uh, during this time because of loneliness, and because of isolation, because of the stress of change. And so as pastors, uh, we need to teach people how to refuel their souls, okay? As a priest, as an imam, as a rabbi, um, you know, one of the things I, I was on a, on a secular uh, um, uh, broadcast uh, a while back, and I said, you know what? Uh, Christians and Jews and Muslims all accept uh, the book of Psalms uh, as the word of God, all three of them. So that's three big religions. Uh, here. I said, here's what I suggest you do. You need to start and end your day refueling your soul. So here's what I suggest you get a Bible and open it up to the very middle, which is the book of Psalms, right in the middle, go to Psalm one and lay it by your bedside. And when you get up in the morning, before you do anything else, refuel your soul. And what I suggest you do is you start reading in Psalm 1, and it doesn't matter how long you read, you just read until something speaks to you. Okay, it may be one verse, it may be five verses, it may be 10 verses. You just read until you're either comforted or you're challenged. Either one is good. That's refueling your soul. And then you stop there and you think about that. You don't well, look at your phone first. You don't turn on the news first. You, you, you don't go to some, some other source of bad news first. You start with refueling your soul. Then you leave that Bible open. And then at night, when you get ready to go to bed, the last thing you do is you pick up that Bible where you left off, okay? <laughs> and start with the next verse. And it may be one verse or five verses or 10 verses. You just read until something hits you. And, and then when you go to sleep, that's the last thing you're thinking about, you wake up next, so you begin and end each day refueling your soul. I have had a lot of members tell me that that's been a lifesaver for them uh, since, uh, since COVID-19 broke out. Uh, set and 
stick with a simple routine. When everything around you is changing, you know, just get a simple routine. And I would say, stop watching so much news. Okay, uh, that's only going to stress you out. Uh, but feed your soul, refuel your soul every day. And then, as you said, you could schedule a daily connection with people you love by Zoom. Okay, don't don't stay isolated from the people you love. You need to connect with the people you love, but that doesn't mean you have to go to their house. You you, you can Zoom with them and just do it like we're talking right here, uh, talking to each other. So those would be your your recommendation about the Psalms, uh, Pastor, because that's where I've been very much this year. I keep going back and reading through again. Psalm 46 uh, keeps coming up, uh, particularly uh, God is our refuge and strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, an ever-present help in trouble. We're in trouble. And some people will go, well, God will take care of us. Well, he says, yes, I'm refuge and strength, and I'm a help in trouble. But God does expect us also to answer the call uh, to do yeah. what Christians have always tried to do in this kind of crisis. It's yeah. up to all of us. I did encounter somebody who tried to tell me it was okay to go to church because Jesus wouldn't let the virus inside those walls. That's a sacred <laughs> faith. I was sorry to say, I don't think that's probably dependable. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of people don't know the difference between faith and presumption. Okay, <laughs> faith and presumption are two uh, different things. God revealed a lot of His will when He gave you a brain, and He expects you to use it. Yes. And so God's not going to uh, God's not going to overrule uh, my foolishness. All right, He expects right. me to use use common sense to uh, abide by good safety things and and to not presume. You know, it's like the I, I remember when uh, Katrina hit uh, and we sent uh, fourteen hundred volunteers from Saddleback. We took up an offering, nearly two million dollars. Sent it there, and for the next four years, I had volunteers working in New Orleans building, even though we're a California church. And uh, there was the old story about the water rose, and, and and a boat came by, and the guy's on his roof, and and they said, "Get in," and he said, "No, no, I'm I'm trusting the Lord." And you know, and then another boat came by and said, "Get in," and said, "I'm trusting the Lord." And then a helicopter came by, and and he didn't. He said, "I'm trusting the Lord." And anyway, the water rose, and he drowned. And, and he goes to heaven, and he said, Lord, you, you didn't take care of me. I, I was trusting, and he says, well, I sent two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> and a lot of times life is like that. When he says, look, I gave you a mask and a smarts to do still social distancing. You know, uh, when uh, this first started, and, and uh, Bob Red, uh, Redfield uh, over at CDC asked me to help uh, get the word out to kids on the three W's, or... Uh, at that time, I was talking about five different things, and so I, I made a video called The Quarantine Shake, and I won't, won't ruin it, tell everybody what that is, but S-H-A-K-E talks about five things that kids can do, uh, mm -hmm. including social distancing and stuff like that, and uh, it, that video is on YouTube. If you want to go look at The Quarantine Shake, uh, it's, it's a dance. I wrote a, dan I wrote a, uh, a rhyming uh, rap and a dance. And, wow. And nobody knows that Pastor Rick wrote it, but I wrote it, but it's called The Quarantine Shake. And, and I think if you've got young kids in your home, go there and uh, help them memorize the three W's or the shake on okay. the stuff they can do. This is called The Virus Going Viral. Is that what you did there? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Going viral for the, for the sake of uh, antivirus. Yes. It's an antiviral antivirus. So... Uh, Let's wrap this up. Any last words you want to say? Let's, let's leave people with some hope. I do want to leave people with hope. We are going to get through this. It's mm -hmm. going to take many more months before we could really say this is in the rearview mirror. We have great progress to report in terms of the science of vaccines and the therapeutics like these monoclonal antibodies. Yeah. But we are also facing the most challenging part of this terrible epidemic yet uh, with uh, the way in which it is now spreading and the cold weather and the uh, uh, risks of being passed by people gathering indoors. So everybody needs to kind of ask themselves, what can I do uh, to save lives? It's pretty simple in many ways, although there are many things that Rick has talked about that you can do for your church to help those who are even more in need of assistance. But 
if for anybody to say, well, it's not about me, um, or especially for a young person to say, I'm probably not going to get that sick if I get this, so I'm mm -hmm. not going to pay attention. They might be the one who spreads this to the grandmothers. So mm -hmm. really, people, we've got to all get our heads around this. Set aside all of the, the misinformation, all the political overlay that's really not been very helpful, and gather together and say, we are the children of God. We are the followers of Christ. We have an opportunity to save maybe 130,000 lives if we do it together. And wouldn't that be the best way uh, to show mm. up? Mm. That's, that's, that's great, Francis. This has really been rich. I appreciate you taking the time to help pastors uh, out there, priests, um, because uh, uh, this is a new thing. You know, we haven't had this ever before. And, uh, you know, in the history of 2,000 years of the church, uh, there's never been a global pandemic where uh, worship was, public worship was not allowed. And by the way, I want to say this. There are some people, Pastor, who will come to you and say, well, this is my right as an American. And this, this is freedom of, of religion and freedom of speech and, and freedom uh, uh, of, uh, of assembly. And so, you know, really the government doesn't have any right to tell me uh, not, not to worship publicly. And I, I say this, well, you know what? You might have a case if we as churches were being discriminated against. And we were the only one telling not to meet. But the fact is, theaters are closed. There are no concerts going on. Professional sports has been canceled, except for a few places where there's people, uh, you know, a uh, hundred yards apart. Uh, the state, there's no stadium filled watching uh, uh, to the brim, watching NFL. And, and so if they, if, NFL was meeting, and if Disneyland was open here in California, and if uh, there were concerts going on, and Christians were the only ones that were told not to meet, you might have a case for discrimination. Yeah. But, but this is a health issue. It's a health issue. And, and I beg you, Pastor, uh, as shepherd of the flock that God has put you over and, and has made you an overseer, the Bible says, guard the flock of God, protect the flock of God, Keep the flock of God safe. Jesus said that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus said that um, the, the hired hand, the way you know the difference between a hired hand and a good shepherd, is that when the problem comes along, the hired hand who's just paid runs away and, and, and leaves the sheep to themselves. And uh, I put the, the safety of, of the flock that God has given me. I'm in the 40th year of pastoring Saddleback Church. Uh, I started it with one member, Kay, uh, you know, when I preached the first sermon, she heard it, she said it was too long, been downhill ever since. <laughs> uh, so this is the time to be aware, the Bible says we must be considered of the doubts and fears of others. So two things I'll close with, uh, and, and then we'll pray. Um, Pastor, encourage your own members to share their feelings instead of stuffing them. This is emotionally and spiritually healthy. Um, feelings are meant to be felt. The only reason you have emotions is because you're made in God's image. God is an emotional God. The Bible said God weeps, God gets angry, uh, God gets frustrated with seeing what's happening on earth. The Bible says uh, God, God weeps, he grieves. And, and the only reason we have emotions is because we're made in God's image. Feelings are meant to be felt. So don't repress it. Don't suppress it. Confess it and express it. And, and teach your people uh, for their own spiritual health and their own emotional health to go ahead and share those feelings of whatever they're feeling. It, it's just a feeling. They're just meant to be felt. And, and uh, I would say then help them to uh, never make a major decision while they're down. Okay? Because it's usually going to be the wrong thing. Seek advice for making a decision. Uh, and then finally, I would say, find someone who's suffering more than you and serve them, okay? At a safe distance, but find somebody who's suffering more than you and encourage your people for their own emotional and their own mental health. Uh, they need to get the attention off themselves and, and, and on to others. Somebody who's hurting more than them, give back and you will find uh, the depression lifting. You will find the discouragement lifting. We need to make a difference with our lives 
We need to get out of our self-centeredness. It's easy in this thing to, to get have a pity party. Yeah. So pastors, thank you for watching this. Share it with your people. Uh, you, we, Francis and I give you freedom to take anything we said and make it yours. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and the way we say it is this. The first time you use it, you say, Dr. Francis Collins said, or Rick Warren said, then the second time you use it, you say, it's been said. <laughs> All right, the second time. And then if you use it a third time, you say, you know, I've always thought. <laughs> so if you can practice it and say it twice before you say it to your congregation, you can stand up with all legitimacy and say, I've always thought. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Francis, for helping me uh, help others uh, oh. during this critical time. Thank you, Rick. Blessings on everything you're doing to try to get the word out there. All right. I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing uh, over uh, all these uh, faith leaders right now. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you for the men and the women who serve you by serving others in local congregations. And uh, this has been a really tough year. I know they're tired. They're exhausted. Uh, they're, they're, many are on empty. I ask you to refill them, help them to focus on refueling their soul every morning and every evening and, and to not go first to the phone and not go first to the news, but go first to the good news and to, as you said in Psalm 23, he restores my soul and uh, help us not to, to get ahead of you, not get behind you. Help us not to have a spirit of fear, but as you said, a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And, and we pray that the witness of every congregation, the testimony in every community will be when people look at the churches, they say, oh, those are the people who loved. They loved us through the pandemic and, and they, uh, they, uh, they kept us safe. So we pray for your blessing on every uh, pastor, every staff member, uh, every deacon, every elder. And uh, we ask this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank brother. You, Francis. Wonderful to be able to spend a little time with you. Give my best to Kay. I will. God bless you. Bless you as well.